Take your Bible and turn to some verses in connecting on preparing yourself for. So write it down this way. Preparing yourself for the judgment seat of Christ. Preparing yourself for the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is going to happen. It's going to take place. And uh, first of all, turn to Romans chapter 4. And uh, I got to go get my Bible in Romans 4. Joe, would you go in my office and get my Bible that I've got sitting there, my big Bible with all my notes in it? I forgot. There's two of them in there, not the red one. I want the black one with all the notes in it. Uh, Ro uh, Romans chapter four 14, and let's pick up verse 12. Romans 14, 12. Preparing yourself for the judgment seat of Christ. This is, has to do with each individual Christian. So then, every one of us, every one of us, shall give an account of himself. Now, every one of us shall give an account of himself. So when that day comes, the judgment seat of Christ comes, you want to remember that you have to give an account of nobody but yourself. So write it down. You're going to stand there alone. So in the margin of your Bible, right there, right down in beside verse 12, you're going to stand alone and nobody will stand with you. You will stand there alone and nobody will stand there with you. So you don't have to give an account of him. You have to give an account of yourself. You don't have to give an account of her. You have to give an account of yourself. You don't have to give an account of your children. You have to give an account of yourself. Nobody, you're going to be there all alone, and you're the one that you've got to give an account of. You've got an account to get account of what you said, what you've done, what you felt, and what you did, and what you didn't do. Good and bad. Lock, stock, and barrel. Total. Give an account of everything you thought, because you're supposed to control your mind. You said you're supposed to control your tongue. Everything you did, you will give an account of it. If, write it in the margin of your Bible, if it's not taken care of here. Write it in the margin of your Bible, take care of it now. And then it's over and it's done with. Write it in the margin of your Bible. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews. And watch how important it is that you confess your sins every day and that you take care of your, the sin issue today. Turn to the book of Hebrews and turn to Hebrews chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter, I'm looking for the verse that says, and, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Maybe it's in chapter 10. Maybe it's in chapter, there it is. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. Hebrews 10, 17. Now, write this down. Hebrews 10, 17, if you don't deal with it now, you'll deal with it later at the judgment seat of Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, Tyler, read me the verse. Hebrews 10, 17. So when you confess your sin here, take care of it here, the Lord forgets, and it's all over with. And it won't be brought up because you, you dealt with it here. So when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, it's over, it's done. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. He forgets about it. 
So when you dealt with it, he's forget. He forgets. He forgets. He forgets, and it's over and it's done. So make sure you deal with it. Don't let anything slide. Okay, so right there in the margin of your Bible, beside verse 16, write down 1 John 1, 9. You're to confess it. Right there beside verse 6, 17, write down 1 John 1, 9. You confess your sins, it's over and it's done. He will not bring it up, nothing mentioned. He won't say a word about it. Why? Because he's forgot it. Ain't that a blessing? He's forgot it. It's over, done. Finished. It's in the path. But that don't mean that you forgot it, and that don't mean that you d dealt with it completely. You gotta complete. You gotta. You gotta forgive yourself, and you gotta deal with it yourself also. The Lord taking care of it immediately. Done. Now you gotta forget it and put it in the past too. Say amen. Don't look back. Don't look back. All right. Now. You're in Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Go to 1 John chapter 4. Take your Bible and turn to 1 John chapter 4. And look at verse 17. 1 John. Take your Bible now and turn to 1 John chapter 4. And let's look at the verse. 1 John chapter 4. And let's look at verse 17. Are you there? Say amen. How many of you are in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17? I'm not there yet. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. I'm there. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, here we go. Verse 17. Herein, now, yeah, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now take your pen and, and underline in the day of judgment, right there. In the day of judgment, underline it. So right in the margin of your Bible, verse 17, 18, 19, and 20, and 21 is all connected with the judgment seat of Christ. That's, what, that's the subject, that's the time. Judgment seat of Christ. Don't take it out of its context. Leave it in its context. Don't take it out. It has a context. So write down a text without a context. Take your pen out, write it down somewhere in the margin of your Bible. A text without a context is a pretext. It's a false text. So every text has a context that it's in. If you take it out of that context, you mess up. Every single time, you mess up. Don't take it out of its context. What's the context of this passage? Judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Don't put it, don't take it over here somewhere and put it over here. It don't belong somewhere else over there. Okay. Herein is our love made perfect. Underline. Love made perfect, rare in verse 17. And draw a line down, it, it, in verse 18 it says, uh, uh, perfect in love, perfect in love. Uh, underline, we love him because he first love us. What's he talking about? Love made perfect, uh, he, uh, he that uh, love, uh, we love him because he first loved us. So the context is your love for Jesus Christ. Write it down. It's your love for Jesus Christ. Say, I love Jesus Christ. Say, I love Jesus Christ. Now, you want it to be perfect. You want it to be perfect. Now write this down. God's, for, God's love for you will never change. But your love for him can change. Write it down. God's love for you will never change, but your love for him can change. We love him because he first loved us. You can fall out of love with Jesus Christ. You can end up loving this world. You can, yes you can. You're a sick Christian, you're saved, but you can end up loving this world. All right, this is talking about your love for him, because he first loved us. 
Now let's go back and get verse 17. Herein is our, here is our, circle the word our, O-U-R. Now write in the margin of your Bible, it's your love for him. Your love for him. Say, I love Jesus. Now, do you love him like you ought to love him? Do you love Jesus Christ like you ought to love him? No, you don't. Right in the margin of the Bible, I do not love him like I ought to, ought to love him. If I loved him like I ought to love him, I would never sin. And I do sin. Say, I sin. So you don't love him like you ought to love him. None of us do. You want to love him better, don't you? Anna, is Anna back there? Yeah. Tell us how to love Jesus more. No, you got to stand up so I can see your lips. Uh, what first did you quote? Now, everybody turn to 1 John 2, 5. Keep your hand right here. But turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. So these verses are connected together. This is 1 John 4, 17 and 1 John 2, 5. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. Whosoever keepeth his word. Do you keep God's word? Okay. Right there in the margin of your Bible, I'll write down, find a verse that you should keep. Now, I've got a verse I'm trying to keep, and I'm having a hard time with it, <laughs> very difficult time with it. The verse says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm having a fit with that one. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. <laughs> Oh, I'm having a fit with it. It says, do all things without murmuring and disputing. And boy, I'm having a fit with it. But I just told you, uh, whosoever keepeth his word, pray for me that I'll keep it. Whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God, what? Perfected. It's made better. So how does your love of God made better? By doing what? Keeping his word. So write in the margin of your Bible, find a verse to keep. Now you ain't gonna find, you ain't gonna keep every verse in the Bible, but you're gonna, you can uh, keep some of them, can't you? Give me a verse that you've kept, Lanny. Boy, that was a hard one too. <laughs> That's my favorite verse, but man, is it hard to do. Do, uh, in all, uh, give me the verse again. Which strengtheneth me. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. That's easier said than done. When I laid in a hospital with the rods in my back, my wife quoted me my favorite verse. <laughs> I can do all, she said, no, you can eat, you can eat, and I hated to eat. I didn't want to eat nothing because her food, food was terrible in the hospital. The food was terrible. But I did eat a little bit, but I lost 35 pounds when I was in the hospital. <laughs> you, can do all through, you can do all things through Christ with strength in me. And I said, Lord, that verse is harder to keep than I thought. <laughs> Come on, find your verse of scripture and keep it, and you know what? Your love for him will do what? It'll get better. Your, your love for him will get better if you keep some of his words. It says, whosoever keepeth, Circle the word keepeth. Keepeth his word in him barely is the love of God perfected. It's made better. It's made better when you keep a, you love him more. So you find a verse, say, Lord, let me keep that verse. Lord, give me grace to keep that verse. Lord, give me power to keep that verse. How many understand what I'm saying? Now I'll go back here. To 1 John 4, 17. Now this has to do with the judgment seat of Christ now. Herein is our love made perfect, that you may be boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. 
Jesus Christ is sinless. Your soul is sinless. You don't have to worry about your soul. So when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, when you get right there, don't think that God's going to put you in hell at that time. Because your, your soul is secure. You don't have to worry about your salvation at the judgment seat of Christ. You don't have to say, wow, look at all I've done. I've done all this, boy, and I didn't take care of it. Oh, the Lord's going to put me in hell. No, he's not. Because you're saved, born again, and in your soul is perfect, just like he is perfect. And your soul is perfect. This is the guy that gives me the fit. And this is the guy i got to give account of. Say amen. See? Not my soul. So what is it? The boldness is you're going to be bold at the judgment seat of Christ because you love him like you ought to love him. And your soul is secure because you're as he is. He's perfect, you're perfect. Your soul is, not your body. You don't have to worry about your soul. Your soul's going to be a-okay. All right? Uh, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Now look at verse 18. Take your pen and look at verse 18. Now I'm going to take the verse out of context. Look at verse 18. Look at it real carefully. I'm going to take it out of context. It says, it says, perfect love casted out fear. So I don't have to fear God because I love him. I don't have to fear him. Did I take it out of context? I sure did. I sure did. It's not talking about outside of, of the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, there's no fear there. But there's fear here. How many of you fear God? You better fear God. You better fear God. You're supposed to fear God. Fearing God is a great thing in the Bible. Fearing God is what keeps you away from sin. Fearing God is a tremendous thing. Oh, never get to the place where you say, well, it's not a big deal. Not really that big a deal. You know, everybody else does it, you know. And Well, a little bit don't hurt, you know. And it's all right. Nobody knows but me. Uh, when you say nobody sees you, you just lied to yourself because God sees you and the devil sees you and you see yourself. Don't you ever say nobody sees me. I'll say it again. Don't ever say... Nobody sees me. Don't ever say, no, write it down. Because this is our human nature. Our human nature is depraved. <laughs> Nobody sees me. So what? The devil sees you, his crowd's around. Amen and amen. Don't ever say, nobody sees me. There's always three people that see you. God, the devil, and yourself. All right, don't ever say, don't ever say a little bit don't hurt. That, that's the problem. That's the problem. Don't ever say, well, it all depends what the little bit is. A little bit, or here's a glass of milk, and, and, and that glass of milk got spit in. You wouldn't drink it, would you? Somebody say, I would not drink it. No, you wouldn't. See, it all depends on what the little bit is. You think the little bit's not very much, but in God's eyes, that little bit may be a great bigger thing than you think it is. You may think it's a little old thing, but in God's eyes, it might be a great big thing. We look at things different than God looks at them. Oh, it's, how many have ever heard this one? Oh, it's just a little white lie. <laughs> oh, it's just a little white lie. And then you get in the habit of lying and lying and lying and lying and you grieve the Holy Spirit when you lie and you give place to the devil when you lie. Now here we go. We're let back to it. All right. Uh, it says, uh, there is there no fear in love, but perfect fear casted out, uh, perfect love casted out fear. That's such a judgment seat of Christ. But because 
fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. That's connected with the judgment seat of Christ. That's not connected with you from day to day. You're supposed to love God and fear him. How many of you fear somebody and yet you still love them? I sometimes fear my son. But I love him because I fear what he thinks. What he thinks bothers me. Come on, folks. Come on. That's the way it should be. You, you say you fear what he thinks? Yeah. I love him. I still fear him. I fear what he thinks. I fear of his opinion of me. His opinion of me makes a great, it's a great place with me. How many of you see that? You folks, your opinion of me, I, I fear it, but I still love you. I fear your opinion of me. You say you do? Yes, I do. You say it shouldn't be that way. Come on, come on. You love your daddy, don't you? you love your father, don't you? Don't you fear him? Yes, you do. You love your mother, but you still fear her. But you still love her. You love God, but you still fear him. Fear him. And it, then it says, we love him. We love him because he first loved us. He loved you at the cross of Calvary, and he loved you when you were unlovable. He loved you when you were unsaved, going to hell like a bullet, and he still loved you. He loved you enough to die for you, and he loved you. All right, again, take your Bible and turn to, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Here we go. Preparation. Preparation for the judgment seat of Christ. The preparation of the judgment seat of Christ. Prepare, Christian, prepare. Get ready, get ready, get ready. I mean, it's absolutely unavoidable. You will not avoid the judgment seat of Christ. You will not get around it. You will stand there alone, and you will give an account. And you will give an account of why, and what for, and when. Write it down. You give an account of why, what for, and when, and because. And boy, you better make it some good ones. Here we go. First John 5. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, no excuse, Lord, no excuse. No excuse. And I'm not going to get up till he tells me to get up. I'm not going to make an excuse for what I've done. I've done it, I'm gonna, and I'm as guilty as I can be. And so are you. First John, uh, second, John, second Corinthians chapter 5, pick up verse 10. Second Corinthians 5, 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's absolute. It's going to occur, and you can't stop it, and there's no way you can avoid it. So write it down. It's going to happen. It can't be avoided. Prepare for an absolute thing. You know, you ought to prepare for something that you know is going to, going to happen. How many of you got uh, prepared for a retirement? A little bit of retirement. Come on, not big. You ain't gonna, you ain't gonna be a multimillionaire, I don't think. But are you prepared for a little bit? Okay, how many are prepared for a car accident? You got insurance on your car. Do you have insurance on your car? Then you're prepared. A lady hit me yesterday in the back of my car. Bam! She took the car up and shook it up like that, and I got out of there, and she was a little teenage girl crying and bawling. And I said, where's your insurance? <laughs> she said, I haven't got any. <laughs> She's unprepared. She's unprepared. What if that girl gets in an accident and kills somebody without insurance on her car? She'll be, she'll be paying it the rest of her life. Because she did, I can't afford insurance. You can't afford not to. If she kills somebody, she'll be in trouble. So when I walk back there, I, I played being mad. I, I played being mad once in a while. Give me your license plate. 
give me your driver's license. She jerked out her driver's license and give me her driver's license. And I said, and we're going to pull out here and park, and we're going to talk about this. And I, she pulled out there and I parked out, and I took her driver's license, and I said, you just banged up my car and hit it and put dents in it and banged in it, and, and you ain't got insurance. She started crying. <laughs> That's a way a woman's way of getting around things. They start crying. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. So I said to her, I said, okay, promise me you'll get insurance. She said, I promise you I'll get insurance. Okay, now keep your promise. And I give her a ride to the back door and turn around and walked away. <laughs> but she promised me she would get insurance on a car to save her own hide. Say amen. So she is not prepared for the unavoidable. But the judgment seat of Christ Brethren, you better be prepared because you can't avoid it. Now it says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every man may receive the things done in his body according to that which he hath done, whether it be good, what's the next word? Or what? One more time, or what? So you got to give account of the good things, and you got to give account of the what? The bad things. That ought to scare you. If it's not put under the blood of Jesus Christ, it should scare you, because you've done some bad things. You say, I, don't, I won't have to give an account of that. Have you ever said something you shouldn't say? Have you ever said something you should not have said? I've heard preachers tell dirty jokes. And laughing. <laughs> oh, wasn't that funny? You give an account of that. How many have ever heard a preacher tell a dirty joke? Raise your hand. One, two, three. I've heard it. I've heard them say words they shouldn't say. I'll put it this way. How many of you have ever heard a preacher say something he shouldn't say? There you go. There you go. Now, you know something? You give an account for that, but it's not put under the blood of Jesus Christ. I have to give an account. Okay, here we go. And knowest therefore, knowest knowing therefore, what's the next word? The what? What's the context? A text without a context is a pretext. The context is not talking about an unsaved man. That's not the context. The context is what? No one therefore the terror of the Lord. The context is the judgment seat of Christ. The terror of the Lord is where? Where is the terror of the Lord? Not talking about an unsaved man going to hell. You take that verse out of context and said, okay, the terror of the Lord is going to, God's going to put people in hell. He's not talking about that. That ain't the context. That's not the verse in front of it or the verse in back of it. But you know what people do? They do this. Well, no one therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men to get saved. Did it say that? Is that the context? Come on, folks. Is that the context? The context is not talking about somebody getting saved. The context, write it down, is the judgment seat of Christ. Well, what did I do wrong with this thing? You don't know? The battery is up. Battery's okay, but when I push that button right there, oh, there it is, the judgment seat of Christ. There it is right there, judgment seat of Christ. So write down, he's not talking about an unsaved man getting saved from hell. That's a different subject. 
it says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We persuade men to do what? Live right, talk right, act right, and do right. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Live right. Get rid of that thing. Do right till the stars fall. We persuade men to live the right kind of life because you're saved and you have to give an account of yourself to God, so live right. How many of you see it say amen? You, you'll be surprised how many people take that out of its context. Do away with the verse in front of it and say, oh, oh man, you mean to tell me I'll tell that dirty joke and I thought it was the funniest joke you can ever believe and, I, and folks laughed at what I said? Then man, boy, I don't have to give an account of that? Yes, you do. People are weird. No one therefore the terror of the Lord we persuade men, but we, uh, we are made manifest to God, and I trust also made manifest in your what? Conscience. See, I do, I do care about what you think. I care about what you think, every one of you. Your opinion counts to me. To me. It means something to me. It says, a guy says, I don't care what you think. It's the wrong thing to say. Because you do. You do care. And if I don't care what you think, what kind of guy am I anyway? I care what you think of me. I care a lot about what you think of me. I mean, I think more of what God thinks of me than what you think of me. I care what God thinks of me. That's much more important to what I think about myself. What you think of me is good or bad. What I think of me is good or bad. But that ain't what really counts. What really counts is what God Almighty thinks of me. Come on, say amen. Now, here we go. Point number, go to 1 Corinthians Chapter 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Now here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now this is preparing for the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4. And look at verse 5. It says, Therefore, Judge nothing before the time. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light, bring to light, underline it, bring to light, they're out there, uh, bring to light. Now, underline the next thing. The hidden, H-I-D-E-N, hidden things, hidden things, of what? Hidden things of darkness. Now somebody tell me what you would think about when you read that. Hidden things of darkness. What would you think that is, Lanny? Would you say it was in the dark? Would you say it was not really something you didn't want people to know about? Could it be day or night? Could it be good or bad? You know what I think? I think it's done in the dark. Men love darkness rather than light because their days are what? Their days are evil. I would say hidden things of darkness ain't very good. That's my opinion. Come on, folks. Hidden things of darkness, to me, would not be very good. That's the way I'd put it. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Hidden things of darkness and will make manifest, manifest the counsel of the what? Underline it. The counsel of the heart. Circle that word, heart. The problem is my heart. That's the problem. Write down Proverbs chapter 4. Right there. Write down Proverbs chapter 4. 
And this is a major verse in, in your life as a Christian. This is a major verse. The counsel, the counsel, the counsel of the heart. It's what you think in your heart. It is what you think inside you. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 30 says, are you there? Are you in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 23? Proverbs 30, verse 23. Proverbs 30, verse 23. Proverbs 30, 23. This is a major verse in the Christian life. It's major. It's not minor. It's major. It's the major thing in the Christian life, you as a Christian. It's major. Why is it major? Read the verse. Keep thy heart with all diligent, for out of it are what? How many, to, how many turn to Proverbs 4, verse 23? Raise your hand. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Right, what did I say? I must have said some other language. What did I say? Never mind what I said. I want Proverbs 4, 23. That's what I want. Proverbs 4, 23 is what I want. I don't know what I said, but whatever. That's what happens when you get old. Proverbs 4, 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. That means watch your heart, watch your heart, watch your heart. Now, how do you know what's in your heart? Brother, tell me. Now, how do you know what's in your heart? You just learned it this morning. Okay, what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. What verse of scripture do you use? It's in Matthew. He's got the book right. It's in Matthew. Carl, it's in Matthew what? Okay, take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, you want to write down Matthew 22 in verse... It's Matthew, 15. Matthew what? 15. Matthew 15. Matthew 15, verse... Uh, verse uh, what verse, Carl? 18. Matthew 15, verse... 15, let's get verse, uh, I can't hear you, Carl, 15, 18, 15, 18, for these things proceed out of the mouth, cometh forth from the heart, and they defile a man, for out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, uh, thieves, and witness, and blasphemy, and now, I mean, uh, right in there, it, it talks about uh, uh, 11, uh, verse 11, out of the mouth, this defileth the man. No, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Where's that at in that passage? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Is that in there? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. This is a very important verse, and I can't remember it. Matthew what? 1234. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 12. And look at verse 34. Now here's the verse. This verse goes beside Proverbs 4, 23. This verse goes beside verse Matthew 4, 23. O generation of vipers, a sweet kind of fella, how can being uh, how can ye being evil be good thing. Now here it is. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth does what? So, 
right in the margin of your Bible. Watch your words. Watch your words. You want to know what a man is like. You want to know what somebody's like. Listen to what they say. Listen to every word he says. Because why? Because that's the heart. OK, write it down this way. Even when you zip your lips, even when you zip your lips, well, you say, what do you mean, zip your lips? I should not say that, so I'm not going to say it. But where is that at? Oh, right up out of your heart, and it's right there behind the lips, and you're just about ready to say it. Oh, you blankety blank, blank, blank. Now, wait a minute. Pay attention to what you just said in your heart. You said blankety blank, blank, blank. Where'd they come from? Come from your heart. It's in your heart, fella. Come on, it's in your heart. And roll right up behind your lips, and you said blankety blank, blank, blank. But you had enough wisdom to keep your mouth shut. You didn't say it, but it's still in your heart. <laughs> I was in, in a jail one day, and one of the jailers said, uh, uh, Sean Scribner, who said that, who said you could, you could use my name? I didn't give you my name, and who said you could use my name? And I said to myself, why, you blankety blank blank. And the word didn't come out, because I had my, my mouth sh zipped shut, because I knew if I said that to that jailer, I'd be a dead duck. So I zipped it shut. And then when I got home, when I got home, the Lord says, do you know what's in your heart? And I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, those words rolled up out of your heart and got right behind your lips, and you was getting ready to say them, and you just had enough wisdom to zip your lips shut, but they're still in your heart. I said, oh, Lord, that blankety blank blank come right out of my heart, and I was getting ready to huh, say it. Do you know what's wrong? The heart was wrong. Because something in my heart shouldn't have been there. Take your Bible and turn to Psalms. Turn to Psalms chapter 51. Now this is what the problem is. The problem is the heart. The heart is what you're going to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. Is the issues of your heart, the hidden things of darkness, make manifest the counsel of the heart in the day of judgment. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. You said I'll to scare you. Well, you should be scared. Take care of it now. Now watch it. Watch it. Psalm 51. How many of you are in Psalm 51? Here's a great verse of scripture you need to memorize. If you haven't memorized Psalm 51, you need to memorize Psalm 51. Because you've got to watch what comes out of your mouth. You say, I don't have to give an account of that. You're going to kid yourself into trouble. Psalm 51, and look what it says in verse 10. How many, how many you got in Psalm 51, 10? Raise your hand. Now let's read the verse. Psalm 51, 10. Create in me, what kind of heart? What kind? So you got to cleanse it and wash it and get it clean because it don't stay clean. You got to cleanse it and wash it because it does not stay clean. It, 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 you're just going through life, man. Just going through life pretty soon. Blam, there's something. Oh, Lord, how'd that get in my heart? Man? Just going through life. Man, just going through life. Watch it when it rolls up into your throat and right behind your teeth and comes out your mouth and you say, that is my heart, that's his heart, and reveals what he really is. Boy, you can tell an awful lot about a man by what he says. Amen and amen. Create in me a what kind? A clean heart. Now, I give you the verse this morning. What verse did I tell you to read, write in the margin of your Bible? N another one. Psalms what? Right, right there you were supposed to write down Psalm uh, uh, Ezekiel something. 
Ezekiel what? Oh, you wrote the cross-reference in Matthew? Okay, give it to us. He's learned to be a preacher. He's learned to be a preacher. Now, everybody, raise your hand if you'll pray for him. Raise your hand if you'll pray for him. Now, you got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 people praying for you that you'll be a successful preacher. Now, that means something. What verse are you going to give me? Okay, Ezekiel 18, 31. Take your Bible and turn to Ezekiel 18, 31. Turn to the verse, Ezekiel. Now, here's where preachers mess up. They mess up terribly. And they mess up terribly because they get this verse and they mess it up, take it out of context. Ezekiel 18, 31. Ezekiel. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, 31. 1831. Now, are you there? Say amen. No, there. when you're there, raise your hand. <coughs> Carl, are you there? Okay, he, he's going to get there in a minute. <coughs> Ezekiel 1831. Now, here's how they mess up. Preachers do this all the time. I've, a lot of them are bad about it. 13 went, cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed and make you a new what? I've got a new heart. When I got born again again, I got a new heart. God gave me a new heart, and I'm born again, and I got a new heart. Baloney. No matter how you splice it. Baloney, baloney, baloney. Now, why did I say that? Keep reading. What does it say? A new spirit. For you die, O house of what? O house of what? Who is that? That's not you. So circle it. O house of Israel, that's not me. God is not talking to me. God did not give me a new heart, and neither did he you. You got the same old heart that you always had. You got to watch it. It'll go berserk. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah. And that's the verse, oh, God, give me a new heart, baloney. And you know why? You know what it does to you? It destroys you and destroys the people around you when you get to teaching that stupid thing. Because you've got to watch your heart. The heart can get proud. The heart can get selfish. The sin can get in the heart and stay in your heart. If you don't keep your heart, the whole thing goes to pieces. You can, you can lose your mind because your heart's not right. The heart affects the mind. Okay, turn to Jeremiah. Now, I'll get, I want to give you a great verse. Turn to Jeremiah, and turn to Jeremiah, and turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Now, this is a very important thing about you as a Christian life. You're walking right, and you have to, the hidden things make manifest the counsel of the heart. And you say, who's going to do that? God Almighty is going to do that. He knows what you're thinking in your heart before you even think it. Because he knows pre-knowledge. God knows what's in your heart. And that's what the, the heart is. What it, okay, I'll tell you what the heart is. Are you listening to me? I say to my wife, no. Tyler, you say to her, I love you with all my head. <laughs> what's she going to say? Get out of here. <laughs> I love you with all my heart. And she got it. See what I'm saying? Your heart is what you love. I'll say it again. Your heart is what you love. One more time. What do you love? Your heart is what you love. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 17. Now look at verse 9. Jeremiah 17, 9. Turn to the verse. Mark the verse. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart. Circle the word. The heart, that's my heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. Wow. Wow. It's the most deceptive thing there is in the face of this earth. It's dece deceptive above anything else. Nothing 
can deceive greater than my own heart. It deceives me. It's deceptive. It's a trickster. You can't figure it out. Watch what comes out here and what's behind the teeth. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately good. <laughs> Did it say that? Did it say it was desperately good? No, it did not. It said, desperately what, folks? Woo, you know what the problem is? The problem is the heart. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? You won't even know it if God don't show you and you don't listen to your words coming out of your mouth. Who can, it? Who can know it? Well, he gives you an answer. I, circle the word, I, I, God knows your heart, I, the Lord, searches the heart. I try the reins. You know when you ride a horse, you ride a horse, there's a horse that has the reins on this side and the reins on this side, and you go like that, and you go like that, and you guide that horse wherever you want him to go. Is that the way you do that? I don't know, I ever rode a horse. How many of you have ever rode a horse? Do you guide him, the horse, with the reins? Then your heart has reins. Your heart has reins. And the reins of the heart are money. I'll say you, I'll say you the reins of the heart again. The reins of the heart are money. How many of you got it? How many of you got it? Why? Why? Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, I don't commit evil. You're not any different than me. The love of money is the root of all evil. Desperately wicked, and who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I, circle it again, try the reins, even to give of a man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Underline the word fruit. Fruit, fruit, fruit. By their fruits you shall know them. You can know a man by the fruits he produces. The love of money. What does God call money? He calls it what? He calls it what? Oh, he didn't call it lucre. There's another word there involved. Ah, there we go. He calls it what? One more time, folks. Filthy lucre. The love of money is the root of all evil. Some guy said to me, Money ain't too bad, it's pretty good. I'd like to have some. <laughs> I said that to a lady one day, and she said to me, she said, Preacher, it's not the love of money. It's what money can buy. I disagree with her. You can love money and be flat broke. Flat broke, and you can still love money. Amen, amen. You don't have to, you can be as poor as Job's turkey and still love money. Or you can be as rich as a millionaire. My brother had a five gallon bucket of gold and he walking behind me one day and said, Nathan, I love money. <laughs> he loved money and boy, he had plenty of it. Ain't that something? He didn't take a dime with him. He went to hell without anything. All right, now here we go. Take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter 3. And look at verse 23. Colossians 3, 23. Now I want you to underline everything counts. Everything counts, Christians, everything counts. Everything you do, small or little, or big, or whatever, everything counts. Everything counts. Colossians chapter 3. Turn to the verse. 
This is the preparing for the judgment seat of Christ. No one that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward. Underline, receive, receive the reward. Underline the word shall. That's future, the judgment seat of Christ. Receive the reward. Now, with your pen in the margin of your Bible, write down, salvation is not a reward. Write it in the margin of your Bible, right there. Salvation is not a reward. It's a free gift. Salvation is not a reward. It is a free gift. So this is not talking about salvation. This is talking about your reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Circle the word inheritance and underline it. Underline the word inheritance. And it's a, it's a earned inheritance. Write it down. It is an earned inheritance, not an automatic inheritance. Some inheritance is earned, some inheritance are automatic. This inheritance is an earned inheritance. Some inheritance every Christian gets. Every Christian gets a mansion up in heaven. Every Christian gets a new body. That's, that's automatic. But not every Christian is going to get a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Some of them are going to come up with Zippo. Now watch it. Watch it again. An inheritance. For you do what? What's that next word? For you do what? You do what? One more time. You do what? Are you, you serve the Lord. You serve the Lord by everything you do. You say, how do you know you serve God by everything? Look at the verse in front of it. Look at verse 23. It says, and whatsoever you do, that means what? That means everything. Whatsoever you do, that means doing the dishes. Come on. I did the dishes for my wife last night. She went in and cleaned up the kitchen and, and cleaned all the dishes and, and took care of the pies and pies and, and took care of it all for her. Does that count? Yeah, that counts. Everything counts. Whatsoever you do. Whatsoever means what? Means whatsoever. That's what it means. Whatsoever means whatsoever. That means anything you do. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as in the Lord and not unto men. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for the preacher. Do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Say amen. Now, serve the Lord. But, but, verse 25, verse 25, but, but, what a terrible word. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect to person, I don't care if he's a preacher. And he that doeth wrong shall receive, he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Can you get away with it? Can you get away with doing wrong? He that doeth wrong shall, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. When it comes to right and wrong, God don't care who you are. Oh, I'm the greatest preacher that ever lived. If you do wrong, you won't get away with it. Well, I can do more things than anybody else can do. If you do wrong, you won't get away with it. You better take care of it now. And, pe and you'd be surprised how many preachers go through their whole life and never consider the verse. Never consider the verse. Go through their whole life, and it don't make any difference to them one way or the other. Because they never look at the verse and don't care about what, what the verse said. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. Now we're going to quit right there because that is my sermon this morning.